So our next speaker needs no introduction. He's Dr. Raymond Cloyd from K-State. Uh, my students adore him, so he keeps coming back to my class every semester, and we love hearing from him. And today he's going to talk about uh, sustainable pest management. And Dr. Cloyd is a professor and extension specialist in horticultural entomology, Department of Entomology, Kansas State University. Uh, he does 70% uh, extension and 30% uh, research appointment at, K at Kansas State. His research and extension program involves pest management in greenhouses, nurseries, landscapes, turf grass, conservatories, interior scapes, Christmas trees, and vegetables and fruits. Ray is a, uh, Raymond is an extension specialist in horticultural entomology for the state of Kansas with a major clientele that includes homeowners, master gardeners, and professional and commercial operators. Ray has published over 70 scientific, and scientific referee publications and over 400 trade journals on topics related to pest management. In addition, he has co-authored uh, or authored numerous books. Some of them are like Pest and Diseases of Herbaceous Perennials, IPM for Gardeners, Plant Protection, and then of course there are several small brochures also that you give out for your talks, don't you? Okay. And uh, Ray is a frequent speaker at state, national, and international conferences and seminars. Raymond has received numerous awards and honors, including the 2011 Society of American Florist. I was there for that. Alex Laurie Award for Research and Extension, that's the one he won in uh, 2011. 2010, so Entomological Society of America, North Central Branch Award for Excellence in Integrated Pest Management. In 2012, he won an award as well from the ASHS. Yes, that's not listed here. Um, sorry. <laughs> and that's enough. So there are, far <laughs> there are a few more. There are a few more awards here. So the latest one he won for the Amer uh, he won in 2012 from ASHS. Thank you. Man, did I do all that? Uh, but anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to talk to you about my favorite subject, entomology, but focusing in on uh, something called sustainable pest management. Um, and so, the presentation I could be giving um, 10 years ago, it would have been called integrated pest management. It's a, still the same thing. The bottom line is people, sustainable is just another wrapper over the same term. Uh, the same flaw. The concepts have not changed, just giving another feel good message. Uh, untrue. So, introduction what is sustainable pest management and the factors associated with that? And if you have any questions or discussion, I hate, I like to move, uh, please feel free to, to ask them because uh, I always like, like to have questions and discussion. So, let's talk about customers. Most everyone wants insect that might pest kill quickly no matter what. It's called a DDT mentality. Am I wrong or right on that? Yes. Okay, so they want them dead. Is, that, is DDT sustainable? Probably wasn't, no. Now we get into this. We are in what I call the head down movement. Everybody has got their head down looking at a, uh, look, at, there's somebody giving a presentation, maybe it was me, and they're looking at, they're trying to figure out the stock market or the score of the baseball game or whatever. Do these people even care about sustainability? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the question we always ask is, we have a society that's so technologically oriented that every new baby that comes out, their left hand looks like this, <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> So my job as an educator is to present, edu uh, educate you or, in, uh, or ed edutain you uh, regarding this subject. And first of all, what is sustainability? There are some true definitions for it. It's capacity to endure, how biological systems, so <laughs> healthy ecosystems and environments provided by services to humans or other organisms, interfaces with economics, the social, ecological consequences, and economic activity. A lot of good terminology there. But I'm wondering how much of it is. Oh, did it fall off? This is. How are we doing? Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, so there is, but really, when you look at sustainability, there's what they call these three spheres of sustainability. There's the environmental one, there's the social and the economic, and they kind of all come together. 
The problem is when you read these, there's a lot of vague information there, uh, a, lot of, a lot of gray. And so when you talk about pest management or sustainable pest management, it's hard to put that in some type of a category. So what I'm going to do is go backwards and talk about IPM, the integrated approach to dealing with insects or mite pests. This is the definition, uh, what's involved, and you can read that, but regular monitoring and then educational tactics are, are the key to making IPM a very viable program in dealing with insect and mite pests. So sustainable is just another wrapper around this type of concept, basically. Okay, that, that's, basic, that's what it is overall. And so what are the components of sustainable pest management? This has not changed since the, the turning of time, basically. We have cultural, sanitation, physical, pest control material, and biological. That's the bottom line. We look at it a hierarchy, though. You try to start with the least toxic, the least toxic, cultural, and then if you need to use insecticides or pesticides, they should be your last resort. And you should start with the least toxic ones. And we'll go over those. So you can, it's sort of an up, upside down pyramid, basically. And we're going to go through that. So first of all, there's a lot of emphasis on soil ecology, which I, I, I am a full proponent of this. Soil contains a lot of uh, microorganisms, mycorrhizae, beneficial uh, organisms. We need to maintain soil health in order for our plants to survive. If we're talking about horticultural plants, we have to start at the basics of plant ecology and the fundamentals there. So the, going, so the first thing is cultural practices. That is, once we put a plant into the ground, how do we nurture it along so that it isn't stressed or it can in itself, in innate itself, defend itself against insect or mite pests? And a lot of plants have that ability. So watering, fertility, mulching, pruning, these all are factors these are all factors that when implemented properly will make that plant tougher and ward off insects, mites, and also some diseases. It's just like our immune system. So the other concept is this, which is, uh, I've been talking about this, is putting in plants in landscapes that don't get pests very much. Um, don't put roses, if unless you want Japanese beetles. Uh, but again, we're, there's a mentality if, we're, if we want to maintain or prevent the input of pesticides, we have to step back and say, what are we putting into the landscapes and how susceptible are they to insects that might pass? For example, this is uh, one year's worth of damage from bagworm. So maybe, we're, and this is actually my yard, by the way, my wife hated it, but uh, I was doing experiments, but one year's worth of three arborvita. Maybe we ought to start planting plants that bagworms eat, even though they are expanding their, their host range. They're not eating just conifers. We see them on roses, honey locusts, a whole broad diversity of trees. They're not stupid. They're going to feed on a lot of broad range of plants. So maybe putting in something else besides arborvitae might have been helpful there. How about this? Oh, I, I, I love this. This is a, a, a volcano, but look at that. That plant is buried uh, six inches mulch. Why do people do that? Do they, Joe? Okay. And you, and you listen to them because they're paying. I know you don't, Joe. But then, okay, okay. First of all, I love mulch is great. Mulch is great. I've used it my, uh, when I was in California. I had my own business for 10 years. We did this. But then you compile watering on top of that. So now you have irrigation, wet media, wet mulch. This tree is history. So that's, a, that's an example in a commercial setting of just poor cultural practices, isn't it, Joe? I'm sorry? Isn't that bad? It is. It, it uh, locks out the body. Yes. The nice place for voles to hide and then girl plants. So again, you know, are, are, first of all, are we treating our plants the right way? And that tree is going to uh, become a, a very good reservoir for wood-borne insects, very susceptible. Here's another problem. Uh, this is a great coat hanger in the wintertime but it's not a good pruning practice. The problem is that when you do this, these stubs uh, die out, but any, this is an Ips beetle, wood blowing beetle, lands on there, eggs hatch, the larva goes straight through, and the tree becomes infected. You know from your horticultural practices that you've got to prune back to the branch collar. That's where you get sealing, and you get less volatiles given off. When you make a pruning cut like this, volatiles are given off that lures these types of insects to those pruning wounds. You guys didn't know that? It's also timing. Uh, for example, you never prune a white birch between April and August. 
because that's when the brown birch bore females are looking for places to lay eggs. April and August is a no-no. You put uh, for white, but we don't plant white birch because it gets brown birch borer, and river birch doesn't. Betula niger doesn't. So that's an example of poor pruning technique. Physical manager. This is my favorite because it's one. It's quick. It's quick and dirty. It's least expensive, and you get fast results. Hand removal, forceful water sprays, pruning traps, and barriers. I'm sure many of you know these uh, for bagworms. Hand picking. I mean, basically, what's the scenario here? Well, each one of those female bags in the wintertime uh, contains 500 to 1,000 eggs. That's how they overwinter. So if you pick them off and throw them away or burn them or put them in soapy water, you're eliminating potentially 500 to 1,000 offspring for next year. Now, we've, we've, we've tried to make suggestions where you have bagworm weekends, take your family out and, uh, <laughs> and pick all the bagworms. Uh, we've talked about, you know, paying, paying to Joe, paying a uh, kid a quarter of a piece for bag. Stimulate. Hey, it's rough out there. You got to stimulate the economy. Stimulate the economy. Things are rough. Um, and then, uh, you know, burn them. Don't put them in a compost pile because the eggs will hatch and the, the crawlers will be all over the place. But again, this is a quick, dirty, easy way as opposed to just using pesticides all the time for bagworm. And so this, this does work. We know it. As long as you pick off the ones that are females. Uh, pruning out damage. Uh, this works very well for fall webworm because fall webworm uh, has these isolated um, nests on like crab apple. Uh, you see these on hickory and walnut in the summer. That's the second generation. But it's pruning out. Now, you want to make sure you don't prune out where you don't destroy the aesthetic value of the plant. Um, we've seen pruning, pruning so much that the plant looks ugly and they have, they have to cut it down after that. Okay, so pruning. And then you give that to your competitor neighbor and see what they do with it after that. So. Um, row covers. This is very popular for preventing striped cucumber beetle and spotted cucumber beetle from infecting cucumbers of the cucurbitaceae. Now, remember, you have to pull this off so the bumblebees and bees will pollinate the flat plants. But it is a physical means of warding off insects that can transmit diseases such as the striped cucumber beetle, which transmits bacterial wilt of cucumbers, or of any tracheophyla. So it's a very physical mode of uh, barrier. And it is effective. I know that many of uh, my clientele and others do use these, especially when they're in areas that have a lot of corn fields. Uh, yeah, Joe? Uh, they try to do it when bees are most active, and that would be in, you know, in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. You want to, you can, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> leave it in the morning, but you can take it off in the afternoon. Yeah. This is a great way to eliminate insects, and it is sustainable. Um, not to this level, uh, you'll blow your trees out of the ground. Uh, but remember this, there is a downside to this. Water is not a registered pesticide. You have to understand that. But it's a very quick and dirty way of removing all life stages. I in fact, I was just in Baltimore giving three talks there. And uh, I tell the landscapers, I mean, this is what I used to do. I used to water, water like you wash your car or used to and removes all the life stages quickly. And the question is, do they come back? The answer is they do not come back. They're physically damaged. Aphids are, uh, the mouth parts are broken off. And spider mites and those uh, are more susceptible to ground beetles and any natural enemies that are on the ground at that point. Uh, so this does work. Cleans the plants. The benefit of this, it does preserve natural enemies because there's no residues. With some of your pesticides, particularly the pyrethroids, they repel insects away. And so you actually, You've changed the ecosystem. Uh, I will say it's less sustainable as a result of applying pyrethroids. And if you do this like twice a week, uh, you can prevent buildup of these, of these aphids and, and mealybugs and spider mites and a lot of uh, sucking insects. They don't work as well for beetles and caterpillars because those will survive. But they do work on your smaller, soft-bodied insects and mites. Okay. Um, I think what we have neglected to look at is how insects the mites overwinter and take advantage of that. Uh, they can overwinter as an egg, larva, pupa, adult, and this is how they survive. They can survive on soil, buildings. Uh, that's how most of webworm survives. Plant debris and soil. But how understanding how they overwinter can help you maybe uh, manage them. Hit hit a weak link. And for example. Let's look at adults, Colorado potato beetle, cucumber beetle, squash bug, asparagus beetle, flea beetles, two-spotted spider mite overwinters adult, tomato and tobacco hornworms, and fall webworm squash vine borer, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, overwinters pupa, and spruce spider mite, bagworm, which I have already mentioned, 
uh, many scales over in his eggs. And so how do you take advantage of that? Well, first of all, you, could, you do a couple things. Well, if you till your garden uh, in the fall, you can expose those overwintering pupa to birds or, or other vertebrates or just the weather conditions if we ever get some decent winter times uh, at that time. And dormant oils are very effective in killing the overwintering stages of scales or mites that overwinters eggs, that are overwintering on the, on the plant, that is. Now, two-spotted spider mite does not overwinter on plants. It overwinters in weeds and debris, so it doesn't work. But for your uh, spruce spider mite, for many of your scale insects that overwinters eggs, dormant oils are very effective. And the last one is if you remove weeds and eliminate overwintering sites for uh, debris, you remove sites for squash vine borer and also for spider mites. So I think this is something that's really not considered as looking at how they overwinter and then removing some of their sources or exposing them to harmful factors. And then in, in the springtime, you're not dealing with as many individuals in those populations. Does that make, them, does that make sense? Good. Um, the, now let's talk about uh, pest control materials. Now, I am not a proponent of using pesticides. I'm, I'm a biological control person, but I'm an educator. And if you're going to use pesticides, my job is to train you how to use them effectively. But when we look at pest control materials, we look at the impact on humans and the environment. There's no doubt about that. Really big was impact on beneficials and pollinators. We have to keep the bees around because if we don't, we are SOL. You guys know what that means because they're recording me, I just found out, so I can't say that. So, um, <laughs> impact on non-target organisms like wildlife and then indirect effects on the ecosystems. And we'll kind of talk about that as we go along. Um, the key to using pesticides effectively is the TCF. Timing of application. What do I mean by that? Applying your materials when the most susceptible life stage is present. Normally, it's going to be the crawlers or young uh, or eggs. Coverage. Most of the materials that you utilize are contact. you are got to cover every plant part. The whole plant. If you miss an area and there are aphids on there and the five of them, on Tuesday, there will be 50 on Wednesday, and then 500 by Friday, okay? Frequency of application. You've got to make applications more frequently in the summertime and spring because insects are cold-blooded, and as the temperature warms up, they are very active and develop and reproduce faster. Now, what is the first thing? Let me just ask this question because we asked, how many in here actually read the label of a pesticide? No way. No way, I mean, you guys are lying to me. There's no way you guys read that. <laughs> okay, if you do, I applaud you, but the label has this type of information, but it also has the frequency of application, and you should always abide. The label is a law. It's a million-dollar document, probably now a billion-dollar document, but it contains a lot of good information. I read labels all the time. They're not quite aphrodisiacs, but, man, they contain a lot of good information, a lot of good information, and I need to for educational purposes. But TCF is the key to maximizing the effectiveness in terms of obtaining high mortality of the insect or mite pest. That's, and these, this, is never, this is never done. People go out there and they spray the top of the leaves and they have spider mites and they expect good kill. Well, where are the spider mites? They're under the foliage. They don't like sunlight, so they go into the leaves. And so you wasted your time and energy and you contaminate the environment, so you've got to use these very efficiently. Okay. So the first, and this goes back to, this is insects, I could be giving this talk in the 1950s, we'd be going back to the biology and the basics, the fundamentals, finding that weak link in the chain. What's the weak link in the chain? And I'll just give an example of mealy, how many do mealy bugs or know what they are? It's when we rear them, and I love them, they're a great uh, bug, but when you look at the life cycle, the weak link in the chain is the early instar crawlers. That's when they're susceptible to uh, natural enemies and most of your pesticides. You can spit on that life stage, you'll kill it. I don't recommend that, you'll dehydrate yourself. But what happens is, as the, and this could be for scales also, as they get more mature, they develop this really waxy coating that impedes the pesticide from penetrating and killing them. And of course, if you don't know this, a single female mealybug can lay 600 eggs. That's a lot of offspring. So the timing of application, frequency and coverage are very important. And this is just one example of looking at, understanding the life cycle. And the life cycles have not changed over the last 40 to 50 years. We know how they survive. We know the number of days it takes to go from egg to adult um, or adult to whatever. And so we know that information, okay? 
Uh, you also have to look at the reproductive capacity of many of these insects and mite pests. Aphids and two-spotted spider mite do not have to mate to reproduce, and you know that an aphid, uh, five of them on Monday will be a thousand on Friday. So understanding the pest will help you decide what to do, and both of these are very susceptible to hard water sprays, blasting them off. Uh, and there are some, there are some we call selective insecticides like soaps and oils that uh, will also kill these too. But again, it's timing, coverage, and frequency of application. You can also look at plant phenology. This is another miss uh, I don't think well. When, when something is happening in the plant world, something is happening in the insect world. We, we go back to degree days. When certain heat units be, uh, build up, plants will flower. Well, something in the insect world is happening. And these are just two examples. When pine needle scale eggs hatch, when hawthorn, Crotagus viridis, is at 50% bloom. And then Yonimus scale eggs hatch when that same plant is at 95% bloom. There's, we have a lot of good indicators here in the Midwest. Van Hoot spirea is an excellent indicator. Um, and you can get this information off the web, but there's also a great book called Coincide. Coincide, C-O-I-N-C-I-D-E, uh, by Don Orton. It's about this thick. I have both volumes. You can, I think, still get it on Amazon.com, but it's an entire book devoted to plant phenology. And when I was at the University of Illinois, we were coming to Kansas, and we had a newsletter, we always relied on that. We knew when Van Hoot spirea was in full bloom, we knew the oyster shell scale eggs were, were, were hatching and the crawlers were out there. So we, who? Oh, Don, uh, Don O-R-T-O-N, Don Orton. Coincide, Don Orton's the author. He used to work for the, I believe, um, the Botanical Garden up there, not the, the, the Chicago Botanical Garden, but the Morton Arboretum. That's where he worked at there. So this is another way, if we're talking about, quote, sustainability, you know, again, this helps time the application that the most weakest link in that pest life cycle, okay? In this case, the scales, it would be the crawlers, okay? Any questions? What's that, uh, is there one, one question. I probably got time for more. Any, any questions? You guys just soaking this up or bored or just ready to go home? I mean, uh, this is great stuff. I love it. It's, it's cool stuff. Now we talk about pest control materials. And there are two categories, conventional and alternative selective. I want to go through the first. The, the conventional ones are the old timers. That's the uh, orthenes and those type. They were broad spectrum. They killed everything. They had long residual activity. Orthene could last four weeks on a plant. Um, but the downside is they killed all, everything, even natural enemies. They actually nuked the ecosystem. They changed the dynamics of the ecosystem uh, because of doing this. And they could be harmful to plants. So I'm just going to go over very rapidly the groups. The organophosphates, your, this is the chemical class. You recognize these, malathion. Orthene is acephate. Uh, I thought it was gone, but Durzban. There's one product still out that has Durzban in it. Um, carbamates, that is seven. That's carbaryl is the active ingredient in seven. And seven kills everything. It is extremely, extremely harmful to bees. You never apply seven when bees are active because it is very toxic to them. And then and bagon is one for sow bugs and pill bugs. Um, the pyrethroids, 60% uh, of the homeowner market is made up of these active ingredients. And they are toxic to most uh, to fish, uh, bees. Um, they don't last very long. They're also toxic to cats. Gypsy right here lost all nine lives with one, app one application. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a cat lover, but that's the problem. It's because these are very toxic at low concentrations. And you, you, bet you have to wear a mask and goggles when you wear these because if you breathe in the vapors, it'll, inst it'll turn on your mucous membranes and you'll either cry a lot, uh, you'll have trouble breathing, uh, and you'll really start swelling up the mouth. It's, these are, you want to be, when you're using any pesticide, you want to wear all the protective equipment. But again, these are still the old timers and then the neonicotinoids. These are the ones that dominate the market right now, the midacloprid. How many have heard of midacloprid have used the product? Yeah, it's been around, it's now off patent. These are also, these are mostly systemic insecticides. And of course, these are the ones, these are the ones that are associated with honeybee decline possibly. Well, that's another issue, you asked me that question, we can spend an hour on it, but these are primarily systemic insecticides that move in the, move, move in, bless you, move in the plant and to kill all your sucking insects, like aphids and mealybugs, soft scales, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, things like that, okay? Uh, 
But the products, these dominate. I know the homeowner market is filled with these right now. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, they had this new one. Um, even though the water solubility is low, it is the most toxic neonicotinoid out there. Um, it, 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 it really does, it does a nice job on insects, but man, it is extremely toxic to uh, bees, honeybees, and bumblebees. So be very careful. Now, let's talk about the ones that people think are sustainable or are, are different. Well, there are the alternatives, and they're, they're not silver bullets. They have problems. They're short residual activity, which means you've got to make frequent applications. They are sensitive to UV light degradation and rainfall. Um, they're less harmful than natural enemies, though, but they're not completely harmful or less harmful. These will kill natural enemies just as fast as one of the conventionals will. The one, the one benefit is they have low mammal toxicity, and we'll talk about that. And they sometimes take longer to kill the insect pests. So you can see that, you know, yes, these are uh, taunted as alternatives, but they do have some issues. And we're going to go through some of these products, okay? By the way, this presentation is going to be, Luck is going to have it on the website. Uh, I could not make enough copies, and I just got back from Baltimore. Um, but she'll have it on the website if you want to download it or, or call me, or, and I can send you a hard copy of it, okay? So let's go over some of these. Let's go over some of these. Uh, first of all is Dipel. How many use Dipel? Raise your hands. Great. You know what that kills? Only caterpillars. But you know what it'll also kill besides your pest caterpillars? Viceroys and monarchs if they eat this stuff. And this is a product. It's the most selective product we have available. It only kills caterpillars. But it'll kill any caterpillar that comes in contact with it. Unfortunately, it's a dust formulation, which I hate because homeowners don't know how to apply dust. They're usually covered with white by the time they're done applying it. Um, but this is one formulation. This is a liquid formulation, which I like much better, so it's thericide um, as a BT. But this is a, a low mammalian toxicity product. I mean, the LV50 on this is like, oh my gosh, it's like oh, oh, probably over 10,000. And we'll talk about LV50. Um, here's a tomato hornworm right here. And people ask me, well, Dr. Cloyd, don't you, uh, you know, you see these bugs out there. What do you do in terms of regulation? And this is one of my options right here. Um, <laughs> I think that is sustainable. It's a phys Boy, you talk about something. When that thing hit my esophagus, it was the best tasting tomato horn I've ever eaten in my entire life. It was fresh, crunchy. Uh, <laughs> it was right before lunch, so I had a little bit of, but it was great. I, I was in the KSU garden. I saw that, man, I got to eat this thing. And I felt good right after that. I mean, it's really energizing to eat these things. It, it would have been better barbecued or fresh, but I, I just went ahead and ate it anyway. So how do these things kill the bug and not kill the humans? Well, they only work on caterpillars because the pH, uh, which is, everybody know what pH stands for? It's, it's a measure of uh, 0 to 14. Above 7 is alkaline. Below 7 is acid. Uh, caterpillars have an alkaline uh, gut. We, what's the pH of our stomach? Acid, hydrochloric acid. It's very low. So the toxin or spore uh, that you spray is then consumed by the caterpillar. And inside this alkaline gut, is converted into a protoxin. And that protoxin then attacks the gut membranes. And what it does, oh, I'd love to show the video of this before lunch, is it causes these pores and the gut contents pour into the bloodstream and it dies of septicemia. It's cool to see the video. Man, these, these caterpillars are sick. They die, they stop feeding within 24 hours and die within three to five days because they can't eat. Their, their, their stomach lining has been disrupted and they starve to death, okay? I remember in a I do all the master gardener training in most of Kansas, um, and one other person says, "Well, does it does, does the insect suffer a lot after that?" <laughs> and and being academic and have to be there, I said, "I'm I, I'm not sure, but you'd have to call PETA about that. I'm not sure they, want, but uh, I'm sure they don't suffer very much overall." So this is the most selective material that you'll probably ever work with. Um, the downside, people ask me though, well, is there a negative impact to this product? And there is. If you kill all the caterpillars, then you've got no food source for the parasitoids. Has anybody seen this? This is a caterpillar, and each one of those white uh, objects is a cocoon of a parasitoid. There's a female inserting the egg. Now inside the caterpillar, the egg uh, undergoes multiple meiosis. We call it polyembryony, and from one egg you can get like hundreds of these. These are great. We call these a bus, uh, a bus of natural enemies, and each one of those becomes an adult parasitoid. So it's a really nice system, but if the BT kills all the caterpillars, you don't have this occurring in the garden 
and part of the ecosystem. Okay? So there's that. Uh, insecticidal soaps. How many use insecticidal soaps? Yeah, they're very good. They're, they're quick contact, no residual, um, but they will kill natural enemies. Any natural enemy like a ladybug, larva comes in contact, it'll kill it. But there's not a lot of residual, um, which means you've got to come back frequently. But they're, very, they're widely used, widely available. Um, here's one. I know potassium salts or fatty acids is the active ingredient. <coughs> And then ho these oils. How many use horticultural oils? Yeah, I really, um, you have to be careful. You can't apply them too often because they can burn plants, but they're very good because they kill all the life stages, even the eggs of most of your insect and mite pests. Uh, you can see here it controls uh, aphids, mites, scales, wi flies, rust, and fungi. Um, but they're very good about killing like egg stages and, and, and such. And, and they work. The, the soaps act as desiccants. They, they, what they do is the, oil, the soap uh, breaks down the membrane of the cuticle of the insect and then it allows water to escape and the insect just dies, it dries up. Oils are termed as suffocants. They block the spiracles. The spiracles are the breathing spores of the insect and they block those and the insect cannot breathe. It dies of asphyxiation as a result. Um, here's one. Kills garden insect. You're around. I mean, is this, is this, I mean, is that sustainable? Kills garden. I mean, that's really a bad message to send. But it does kill garden pests. This is a paraffinic oil that I wake you up as a result of that. Uh, kills them without synthetic chemicals right up through harvest day. I mean, this is this is the, the, the uh, this is better than anything. So there, there's another one. Uh, dormant oils again coming back to them. They're very good against killing. Uh, mites and scales that overwinter our plants. Uh, spruce spider mite is one example, and then like the onima scale, uh, those types that overwinter our plants. Remember, these are only applied in the winter time when the plants, uh, the le the trees have no leaves on them. Okay. Spinosad. Does anybody use or heard of spinosad as a product? It's a very good insecticide. It's very good against uh, four groups of insects. The first one is caterpillars. It's a good caterpillar material. It's also good for thrips, uh, which is a pest on roses and other plants, leaf miners, and certain beetles. Uh, it is registered for cholera potato beetle, but it's those four groups, certain beetles, caterpillars, thrips, and, uh, and uh, leaf miners. Very good against them. Um, I, worked, I worked with this product four years before it came out professionally, and I was very impressed with its level of efficacy and safety to beneficials. It's very benign on, on, on many beneficials, even though the wet sprays will kill parasitoids. But here's one of my favorites. Here's Natural Guard. If you, uh, you, it's, it's natural, it's organic, and reduced risk, but keep out of reach of children. <laughs> uh, there's something, but there's another product that's spinosad in it. Uh, and it is a very benign material. It does break down. It is from a, a fungus called Saccharopolysporus spinosad. Say that five times fast. Um, but trust me, that's what it, it's from a, uh, an organism, and it's very effective against certain groups of insects and, and no mite activity. It's pr pretty much an insecticide. Uh, Azadiractin is an insect growth regulator, which means it only kills the immature stages uh, and also is a repellent. It doesn't work on a lot of insects. If I was to say what's its strength, it's on caterpillars. It works pretty well on caterpillars. But on this label, you'll see aphids, beetles, thrips and white flies. I have evaluated this product on a lot of different insects and pests, and I have never found it to work. But caterpillars, it does exhibit activity. Uh, neem products. Uh, this is an oil base. Both the azadiractin and the neem oil come from the seeds of the azadiractin tree, azadiractin indica. And, but this is the oil-based material. This is the insect growth regulator, excuse me, the insect growth regulator, but now we're in the oils. And this is a suffocant. Um, so this is neem oil. Neem oil, okay? Botanicals. Uh, botanicals are derived from plants. Uh, we have several still available. We have retinone and pyrethrins. Uh, we'll go over those. Um, pyrethrins are de derived from the chrysanthemum flower, chrysanthemum cinerarifolium. Um, they're very short residual is one of the problems with them. They, have a, they kill a lot of different insects and mite pests. And there, there are, many of these are, are certified for organic production. Uh, there's a product called Pyganic that is uh, on that list. Um, but there's pyrethrins. Uh, Rotenone is another one derived from Darius and Longocarpus. The problem with Rotenone is it's a fish killer. If, you wanna, if, you're, if your neighbor has $1,000 koi and you want to hear somebody scream, 
put some rotenone dust in the pond. They'll go belly up. The other problem with rotenone is this, is that recently mice, inf uh, mice injected with rotenone, they uh, exhibit symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And rotenone attacks the same target site as Parkinson's disease does. Rotenone attacks the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, of course, you remember your biology, is responsible for what? Energy, ATP. And so rotenone and Parkinson's disease block the production of ATP, and so the individual is not able to produce energy. So rotenone has really lost favor in organic production uh, and a lot of other stuff. I wouldn't even claim it as sustainable at this point. It's really got a now bad reputation. Uh, nicotine is, <laughs> this is death in a can. Uh, nicotine is very toxic. Here it is as tobacco dust, but it does say naturally controls. Yes, it does. Um, but if you breathe or get this on your skin or inhale it, uh, you end up having to go to the hospital. This is one of our most toxic botanicals. Uh, if you look at the LD50, does everybody know what the LD50 stands for? Okay, if you don't, LD50, every pesticide has an LD50, and it's a lethal dose that kills 50% of the test population, and the lower the number, the more toxic the material. Look at where nicotine and rotenone fall into play. They are more toxic than 7 and malathion. Here's pyrethrins, and then here's neem. 13,000. Uh, a very, very safe material, but the, the, the dogma or the misperception that natural is safer really doesn't hold true when you look at the, these products that are derived from plants. Okay? So, there, there's, so be very cognizant of that. Um, there's also these plant-derived essential oils we've worked for many years. They're also considered botanicals, but they're mostly oil-based. Uh, this is just a list. Uh, we know that if you use garlic oil, you don't have problems with vampire bats. We know that right away. <laughs> Does anybody know what lemongrass oil or stretchanel oil is used for? Mosquitoes, it doesn't work, but it is labeled for that. <laughs> we, got, we got the data. It doesn't work. Um, and delimiting, if you've got pets, that's what you use or wash your dog or cat with, is uh, most of your flea or tick shampoos have delimiting, which is derived from the orange peels. Okay? The problem with these, I'll say right off the bat, is they don't kill what they're labeled for, and they can be phytotoxic. They're oil-based, and uh, they can kill plants. Um, they, they, they smother the stomates and the plants can't uh, exude uh, oxygen and can't take in CO2. Uh, these are another list of them. You'll see a lot of these in garden centers, homeowner shows. Uh, they are uh, obtained from steam distillation. One point I want to make is they are attacking the central nervous system. They are nerve toxins. People don't understand that. Uh, they think, oh, well, these things are oils. Well, not really. They have multiple modes of action, and one of those is attacking the octopamine pathway, which is part of the central nervous system. So they are, they are nerve toxins, just like malathion, seven, and those conventionals we've already talked about. Um, here's the problem. Uh, we've evaluated almost all of these. Uh, I could tell you one that does work. Rosemary oil does kill spider mites. That's it. Um, <coughs> so phytotoxicity and then the fact that they're labeled for everything under the sun, but they don't kill anything. Uh, that's one of the issues we're, we're, we're struggling with. Um, this is one of my favorites. I, I go into the garden centers. I look at these products. It's organic. It's eco-smart. But look what's in it. It's got uh, everything under the sun. But if you really look at this label, what are you mostly buying when you buy a product like that? Water. 91% water. It's expensive water. The other thing about this is sodium oil sulfate. Does anybody know what that's in? Soaps and women's shampoo. Um, Eugeniol. Eugeniol is a nerve toxin and attacks the central nervous system. Um, so these products, and I look at, well, what's the killing agent? They just kind of put this stuff together and they call it organic, and uh, it really is not as, uh, as safe as people think it is. Yes, ma'am. Uh, wh wh which, which one is that? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, sodium oil sulfate is in many, I think you said, uh, Client cleaners and stuff. Did you say that, Keith? Yeah. Yeah, you read the label for any product, you'll see sodium oil sulfate. I've seen it in women's shampoos and perfumes. It's in a lot of uh, uh, a lot of them products. You never think something like that. And yet they put it in a product and they have a, a girl and a dog on there saying it's safe. Uh, and again, eugeniol is itself a nerve toxin. It's actually a pretty potent material. Be very careful using it. And they've got something else in there. I don't know why. 
but you're mostly buying water, potassium oil, and lectins more than anything else. Um, most of your broad spectrum materials are, 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 well, they disrupt the ecosystem, but people don't understand what they do. When you apply seven or a, a metacloprid, uh, what are you doing to the ecosystem? Well, first of all, you're disrupting the natural enemies, and there are two terms there. One of them is called secondary pest outbreaks, and the other one is target pest resurgence. Um, when you spray a pesticide, soaps will do this also. So when you're out there spraying, uh, this is what you can do to your, your uh, yard or your system. What secondary pest outbreak means is you have a target pest like aphids, you come in with orthenes and you spray. And you kill, the, you kill the aphids, yes you do, but what you didn't know is you had two spotted spider mite there. And what was taking care of the two spotted spider mites? Predatory mites. Well, the orthene killed them and now the two spotted spider mites got no regulatory process and that becomes your primary pest. You're forced to spray, so from this point on, you basically have disrupted the ecosystem and you're on what we call the pesticide treadmill at that point. You have to spray to keep the aphids down and now you're gonna keep the, the mites down. Not a good scenario. But let me tell you this, you'll read in magazines that soaps and oils won't do this, they'll do this. They'll, do this. they'll kill predatory mites, they'll kill green lace wings, they'll kill surface flies, the other one is target pest resurgence. What that means is you come in and kill the aphids, but the aphids rebound higher because there are no more natural enemies anymore. And, they and natural enemies typically and theoretically take longer to catch up with the populations, and so you really are, you've got yourself in a, a bad situation. Okay, so that is some of the dynamics that occur when you're applying, even you know, fungicides will do this. Many of your fungicides, or broad spectrum, they'll also kill natural enemies. We did a lot of work in our laboratory on that, and it, it does show that fungicides can also kill uh, mites, ladybugs, green lacewings. Maybe not the active ingredient, but maybe the inert ingredients will kill them also. Okay? Um, now, what's really popular from a sustainable approach is conservation biocontrol. And what that means is you're putting in plants in a garden that lure or retain the natural enemies that are there. And I like that concept. The problem is that people don't understand the entire philosophy and population dynamics that occur with this system. What you're doing is providing plants that attract natural enemies with pollen and nectar for adults primarily. Um, not all flowering species contain pollen and nectar that natural enemies use. They're not all useful to natural enemies. Secondly, many of those plants will attract other natural enemies that don't even impact herbivores. Uh, blister beetles. People bring goldenrod, attracts blister beetles. Blister beetles are not a very good biological. In fact, they're more of a pest than anything else. Uh, so you bring in a lot of different stuff. I remember several years ago, we put in a, uh, a, a garden and they were putting milkweed in there. And they thought, great, I got milkweed for butterflies. Come to find out they had the milkweed aphid all over the place. So they, they were basically, uh, plant species differ in their attractiveness and many natural enemies cannot access the pollen. The flower has to be a certain morphology for these natural enemies to get that pollen and nectar, and if you get deep, narrow corollas, they can't get at it. They can't get it as a food source. It's useless to them. So you have to make sure you understand that not all flowers are created equal. Fortunately, we do have information, and I help the master gardeners, there is a list of plants that do attract and retain and have abundant pollen for natural enemies, and these are them. Queen Anne's lace is a great one. Most of these are in the uh, chrysanthemum and the carrot family, the compositia and the umbelliferae family. Uh, some of these are not the most attractive plants, but you can intersperse them with your uh, perennials and annuals, okay? And this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of good information. Uh, I've written articles about this, but this is at least a starting point for you to understand that Queen Anne's lace, dill, fennel, coriapsis, coneflower will attract certain natural enemies. And, and if you have them, remember, you have to have these things blooming throughout the year. You can't have everything blooming in April and nothing after that. It's gonna be continuous blooming throughout the year with many of these types of plants. Because certain natural enemies will be uh, er early on, but then you'll get a different complex of natural enemies later on in the season. So you have to kind of understand that, okay? Um, I promise you this will be the only X-rated bug picture I show. <coughs> um, but it's a prime example of conservation biocontrol. This is a parasitoid of green June beetle called Scalia dubia. It's feeding on wild garlic or onion uh, as an alternate food source, but these alternate food sources are great mating sites. These are two uh, soldier beetles going at it. The male's on top, the female's on the bottom, and that's all I'll say about that. 
but they make great mating sites and a food source for your water natural enemies. And I know, are they filming this? They're good, they're not now. Uh, but this is an example of conservation biocontrol. The question I get about, what about companion planting? And I brought two of the books that I have. Carrots love tomatoes, and then the other roses love garlic. Um, has anybody got these books? Yeah, I mean, the first, there is no scientific data to back up the companion planting wards off insects or mites, except for one example, which isn't an insect, but marigolds will protect plants from plant parasitic nematodes. Um, the roots of marigold give up exudates that either repel or directly kill plant parasitic nematodes. That's the only example of companion planting that works. None of this is, in, if I had some extra dollars, I'd look at it, but there's no scientific data to support Companion planting results in less incidence of insects or mite pests. There just, it just isn't there. Yeah, Keith? Why do you need that? <coughs> oh, that's a, that's a good question. It was, yeah, uh, it, it was not the French, it was the other ones. It was not the French, Mexican, Mexican yeah, I forgot, Tadjetis, but it, what's that? It's something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the French one, it was the other, not, not Petula, the Tadjus Patul. African, thank you, African. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was a horticulturist first, but some of this is gone now because I think bugs all the time. But yeah, it, it was, it was that, that marigold species or, or genera that was repellent, not the, not the Africans, basically. Okay? But that's the only example where, in a California one, where you're from, you go down the vineyards, the grape fields, they got marigolds planted all along there because. Uh, those grape fields are uh, susceptible to a species of nematode called Ziphonema and, and, and the uh, root knot nematode, Meloidogai, and those are not bothered when you have the marigolds there. It protects the root system. But that's the only one, people, the only example of companion planting that actually is effective. I, there's several, I hear other things like nasturtiums will keep um, spotted cucumbers away. Um, I like to test that. But it's like somebody told me a couple of days ago, I hang banana peels on my trees and I get no aphids. And, and I, I got to test that. I really got to test that. And so, what's that? That's a great question. It's a twofold question. Was if you haven't heard, she asked, "Is that because nobody studied these?" Um, and what was the other part of that? But has, has it been studied? And yeah. Okay. The bottom line is. The bottom line is. Yeah. Right. The question is, have these been studied? That's number one. And if they have been studied, do they show ineffectiveness? There have been studies, by the way, that shown it has been ineffective, but not enough. I think if we had unlimited dollars, I think we should really look at this. I would love to look at nasturtium on spotted cucumber beetle. I've heard people talk about that one, and there's a, I have a list in my, my office of other ones. Um, but again, you have to understand that the plant how is the plant keeping your main plant from being eaten by spotted cucumber beetles? You're more using these as a trap crop more than anything as opposed to a companion planting. You're luring insects into a more favorable. We try to use this for flea beetles. How many deal with flea beetles? You know what, uh, if you plant eggplant, what's the pest you get? Yeah. Flea beetles. We've been kind of indirectly looking, okay, what can we plant that's more attractive to eggplant to keep the flea beetles away? And that's some indirect research we're doing is maybe putting in a different variety of, of, of uh, well, let's say another eggplant or another plant that they really love. But man, eggplant and flea beetles go together like love and marriage used to. I mean, it's a great thing. Yeah, so, 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 but those are used as trap crops. Not comp you're luring the insect away from your main crop onto something else. You can spray that plant or you can pull it out and get rid of the, or actually, I bet people use a vacuum cleaner and vacuum them off uh, those plants to keep the trap crop and then they take the bag and they give it to their neighbor after that. Yeah. <laughs> what works for me is to spray them heavily with water. <coughs> yeah, the water one, yeah. It, now, it'll knock them down. It won't kill them because the flea beetles have a hard cuticle, but it will keep them off the plants, yeah. yeah. yeah yes, ma'am. Uh, how much of this concept of companion planting in biodiversity as far as mixing plant species together so that the insects can't find your, your crop? Monoculture attracts insects, right? Because find it easier? Yeah, the great question about using these as a polyculture and getting away from monoculture, um, that's the issue. Monoculture 
you tend to have less diversity, and so when a pest comes in, there's not many natural enemies, whether it be fungi or whatever. Um, I'm not sure that's the concept of this. I think they're trying to use it as a means of either repelling insects away or luring them in, not as a focus point of, because many of these companion plants, natural enemies don't like. Nasturtium is not a good uh, plant for predators or parasitoids. So I think they're using it, that's a great question, they're using more as a, a, a uh, repellent or a, a, a trap cropping, more than, or as intercropping basically. But that's the problem is why do we get a lot of insect pests? And that's a good part of sustainability is you want to plant polycultures. You want to plant a genetic diversity of materials so you don't end up with the Dutch elm disease syndrome, the emerald ash borer syndrome. When these invasives come in, they attack a plant like ash right now, and there's lots of ash all over the place, green and white, black, or blue ash. So we do too much monoculture and not enough polyculture, and that might be another component of sustainability is you want to pl plant genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is, is very important in that. Okay, so with that, um, those of you, it's a Friday afternoon and are having a difficult social life. I recommend you rent my favorite bug movie of all time, Them. Has anybody seen this? It is the best movie of all time. It was made in 1954. I wasn't around, but uh, it's a great, you learn about gigantic ants, you learn about ants. Some good actors in here, James Whitmore, um, Mr. Miracle Girl, James Arness, Gunsmoke, um, and then um, Fess Parker, Davy Crockett has a small role, and, and Little Nimoy has a 15 second slot in this movie. Not the point of years, but you'll recognize him near the end. So I have seen this movie probably over 200 times uh, since I was a kid. Uh, I, I, love, I love all those big bug movies. So with that, I thank you for attention. Hope you all learned something about sustainable pest management. So that is question time. <laughs> Yes. Any questions? Take a couple. Yes, sir. The oils are meant to block the stomata, right? And suffocate the pests like they Oh, they block the spiracles. The stomata is for plants, yeah. Why wouldn't one oil work the same as the other? Why wouldn't all oils create that function? The question was about oils and the way they work. Uh, they're all suffocants. Uh, and that's how they work. They're all suffocants, basically. But there are different oils. I presented the uh, petroleum-based oils and the paraffinic oils. They all work the same way. But they're just different types of oils. <coughs> based on the um, you are that one. You are these unsulfonated residues. How many residues are in that oil product? But they all work the same way. They either block spiracles, or the another thing that they did is they will allow water to move through the spiracles, and the insect uh, drowns in fluids. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. Baby oil, remember this. Don't use detergents, oils that are not registered pesticides. Don't use Joy, palm olive. Why? You can burn your plants. There's a lot of degreasers in those, and they do not have an EPA registration number, which means you're using it off-label. I get that's a great question, but never, never use oils or soaps and detergents that are not registered pesticides. You can run into more problems than you uh, are trying to solve. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it, it was the French marigolds. Uh, uh, yeah, they were using Tajedis patula. Is that, the, is that the French marigold? African, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't remember if they tried others, but I do remember that paper. It's, I know the file it's in. Uh, that was the one they used, and it was the, the only example of using a plant to ward off an insect, and it, well, actually, in this case, a nematode, to protect your main crop. In this case, it was grapes, because grapes are very susceptible to many different nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic roundworms that are in the soil, and there's thousands of them in, 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 our, in our yards, uh, but they do many of those to attack plants. Um, yeah, yes, yes, sir, Jim. What I recommend for you in terms of what now? <laughs> well, right now, the only way you can have that sustainable crop is if you have a crop that's not going to be affected by the oils and the pesticides. His question is, and if you come to the Topeka Garden Show tomorrow, I will be talking about AAB at 12 o'clock. Um, but let me make it, what can we do for AAB? The first thing is do not panic. Don't panic. It has been found but not established in Kansas. Um, the key thing is keep your plants healthy. Allow the natural defense mechanism to do their thing. Um, 
There are systemic insecticides that are available. Um, they work, but it's also a timing issue. If your plant is over 50% infested, forget about it, it's too late. But there, there is preventable. There, so imidacloprid, uh, Safari, which is dinotiferon, and you've probably heard of the new one called triage, which is imamectin benzoate. It's a uh, one that's supposed to last two years. So there are products, but to me, the first thing is don't panic. Uh, again, keep your trees healthy right now. Because, pardon? It's too soon. It's too soon. Yeah. They found it wine dot in August. They found it, but that doesn't mean it's established. I'd wait till next year to see what happens if we if they start because they're really doing intensive de intensive monitoring. Let's see what happens. Don't panic. I was in Illinois when they had four to five infestations and people just panicked. They cut down ash trees all over the place and they replaced them with some other monoculture plant. But uh, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, I mean, honey locust. <laughs> yeah, we don't learn from history, but uh, that's what I would do. So, but tomorrow I'll be talking more in depth to the homeowners, people are interested about, you know, what their options are. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Beneficial insecticides or beneficial insects? Yeah, that's a great question. What is my what is my philosophy of purchasing and releasing beneficials? I don't recommend it. Um, we call that augmentative biocontrol. And what happens is when you release the insects, they tend to go all over the place. Ladybugs do that because of the time they harvest. I my philosophy is put in plants that retain what you've got, and, and utilize those natural enemies. And most of those are green lice wings, surfeit flies, ladybugs, parasitoids, uh, ground beetles, those such. That's what you want. You want to create an environment that's conducive for their survival and they will stay there. Releasing natural enemies run the risk of um, them flying off and going to your neighbors or somewhere else. Yeah, I'm not a proponent of augmentative biocontrol for the homeowners. In a greenhouse, yes, but that's an enclosed system, but not in an outdoor situation. Yes, sir. Japanese beetles are picking the best control. <laughs> Japanese beetles picking them off. Uh, that's a great question. What about Japanese beetles? Picking them off is good, but when you're dealing with thousands or hundreds of these things on the plant, it's too late. Um, we will, unfortunately don't have a lot of good controls for Japanese beetles other than conventional insecticides like seven and uh, pyrethroids. Um, we don't have any biologicals, unfortunately. Um, so picking them off, don't plant roses. <laughs> Yeah, if, if you just get, yeah, and they're really easy to pick off because when you come up to them and touch, hit the branch, their legs flare off, they go down and they fall off. So just put a soapy, a can of soapy water under them and they'll fall right in and they'll, they'll die. We, in Illinois, uh, we had massive numbers, but when they were small numbers, people would go through there and use those. Do not, I repeat, do not buy the Japanese beetle traps because they'll allure more Japanese beetles than you'll ever see in a lifetime. In fact, our in fact, our extension recommendation is give those to your neighbors as Christmas presents. <laughs> That's what we say. That'll protect you, from, but not the, yeah. So, any other questions? Thank you very much. I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>